start with some quick introductions. I'm Marvin Talisma. I am currently the product manager looking after the scripting part of uh, Climate Field View uh, for all of our regions around the world. Uh, I came from the commercial side of the business, so working with people that talk in zeros and ones is quite uh, new and interesting. I'm Christina Prelaz. I'm a field product specialist with FieldView. Um, so helping with data collection and bridges and gaps between our R&D and our commercial team. Previously, I was an onboarding specialist with FieldView, so you probably heard from me if you needed any troubleshooting or if it was your first time on FieldView. Um, I help cover southwestern Ontario. So we're um, hoping to share with you today. So we are actually filling in for Andrew Elgersma, who uh, really wanted to be here. Unfortunately, he had a family funeral that he uh, needed to attend uh, this morning uh, or today. So he's unable to be here. So um, okay. if you don't hear what you thought you were coming to hear, that's our fault. <laughs> um, but we're here to hopefully show you ways where data that you produce on your farm can provide you some value, provide you some insights, maybe change how you think about doing things on your farm. And um, so back in the early 2000s, something happened in baseball. There was a movie made about it. Does anybody recognize somebody from, a, from the screen or remember what movie was made back in the early 2000s? No? I know the movie, I can't think of the name of it. Brad Pitt started. So yeah, so back in the early 2000s, teams either had lots of money, like the Yankees, Red Sox, and Texas Rangers, over $100, $120 million. Uh, Oakland and some other teams down here, they were less than $40 million. So Billy Bean, who Brad Pitt portrays in the movie, was the general manager, and he was tasked with trying to win with a lower budget. Couldn't sign these big money players that New York could to try to win a championship. So he thought, how can I do this differently? And data and stats has always been part of baseball, but he looked at it differently. He looked at Peter Johnson as a first baseman. How many errors did he make in the nine inning game? How many hits did he get per nine inning uh, at bat? Were they multiple bases? Did he Was he able to actually get a hit from somebody on base and move them around and try to really broke it down um, into data and looked for those players that maybe nobody heard about or nobody knew, but could provide value to him by providing hits, providing strikeouts, getting outs if I'm a pitcher, etc., pitcher, etc., cetera, et cetera, and putting a team together that way and competing. I forget the end of the movie. I don't know if Oakland actually ended up getting to the playoffs or competing with the Yankees and the Red Sox, but that was the premise, and it changed sports around the world and how data and data analytics is used when looking at players and putting them even on lines if we're thinking hockey or in a line. And how many here have a field that is going to yield 75 bushels of soybeans or 200 bushels of corn on every single acre in that field? <laughs> if somebody said yes, I want to see that field and I want to see the proof. Because it doesn't happen. We have variability, right? Everybody has, we have variability in our field, whether it's soil type, whether it's drainage, whether it's tile, there's variability there. And we need to try to use some of this information that data can provide to capitalize and turn some of these negative numbers into positives or turn some of these positive numbers even into higher positive numbers. Get that return on the investment that we're making and, and being profitable. Margins are getting tighter. Um, I hear that from, from farmers uh, and the people that I work with all the time. So how can how can something like FieldView help us do that? Well, we're gonna start with, uh, you know, doing some, some different trials. And uh, back in 2021, we started hearing a significant amount of uh, talk about tar spot. Tar spot's a new disease to corn to us. We're learning about it. We're learning if there's hybrid differences. We're learning what fungicides have activity on it and actually um, are able to uh, keep it in check. I heard, you know, I've heard up to 40 bushel loss uh, if I didn't apply a fungicide in corn because of tar spot. Well, how do I know that? How do I know that I'm getting that value? And this is a field uh, of a customer here in Southwestern Ontario that um, <coughs> applied 
a fungicide back at Tassel back in July 27th of last year. You can see that this farmer left two untreated checks. So one of the things that uh, I don't think we've determined yet is, can we determine the progression of this, this disease using some tools like imagery, whether it's from a drone or a satellite, are we able to follow it and track it? I still think we're learning. I don't know, I haven't heard if, if we're able to do that. There are models out there, growth models, and um, looking at how this spreads to determine if, if that can help us, but we're not quite there yet. So we need to know if spraying a fungicide actually gives us a return on investment. So if I split my screen and actually, you can actually see from a satellite image as we progress through. So here we're back in July prior to the application. You know, this field is showing more biomass on one side than the other. I will tell you that there's a hybrid split about just past where that yellow box is. There's two hybrids in that field that could be contributing to why we're seeing different levels of biomass. As we go through and get into later season, you can start to pick up those untreated checks. So I can move my, my X on the screen into an untreated check. And you see it lines up with that lower biomass area, that red strip, which is the lowest level of biomass in this field. So one, I can assume that my fungicide that I applied back in July 27th is having an in impact in keeping the field that got it healthy, keeping it green and growing and, and contributing to yield. At the end of the day, I do have a yield map for this field. Um, you can see the legend here isn't great. I should adjust that, but you can see that, you know, there is higher yield where we applied the fungicide versus where we didn't, um, but how much? And that's where you either need a way wagon or a scale on your yield card to really verify this. With Fieldy, we can do multiple trials and use our field region report to do that. So if I select that yellow region, it's the untreated check, should come up at 216 bushels per acre. Um, and if I select the blue one, it's uh, where we applied to Alero Complete, and we had 236 bushels per acre. So we had a 20 bushel yield advantage in this particular field. So for that farmer, he or she knows that, okay, I made the right decision applying this fungicide on, on, on this field. Probably next year, if they have similar conditions, or they might not leave an untreated check because who wants to lose 20 bushels on five acres, whatever that untreated check uh, is. Of course, this year we had no tar spot, so. I know. <laughs> well, there is some, but it's not nearly as severe as it was last year. It's, that's what my guys are telling me. Yeah, very little. Um, so that's, that's one way to evaluate what you're doing in the field. And you can do this with whether it's a hybrid or variety or fungicide, different fertility programs, things like that. Um, one of the things in Western Canada that um, we're doing and we're, we're evaluating whether or not it, it can be done in, in a bean crop here in Ontario is turning an, uh, an image like this, an NDVI image into a prescription that we can load into our sprayer to tell the sprayer where to spray and where not to spray for certain things. And we're looking at, this is sclerotinia and canola. So same sclerotinia that we look at when we look at soybeans here or, or edible beans. Um, canola, I, I'm told, I haven't done a lot of it, but I'm told canola is not fun to scout. At the stage, we need to scout it to determine whether or not I need to apply it for So using a tool like imagery um, can help us with that. If we can get a yellow index and see the actual flowering progression of those fields. Today, I'm told that a lot of scouts go into a canola field about July 1st um, at noon. They walk in 20, 30, 40 feet, come out. Oh, my boots are wet. I should spray. Condition looks like we're going to get moisture in the next seven to 10 days. I should probably spray for spare to me. Not very scientific. Uh, not the way I would like to make a recommendation. So, we still need to put boots on the ground, but one of the things we can do in field view is take an image like this and turn it into an application script where now we've got the green is where we're going to apply our fungicide and the red is where we're not. This disease, we know that 
higher biomass, more growth in that field, we're likely to get more, we're more at risk to having that disease progress. So that's why we're looking at, at this method of applying a fungicide. Anybody here tried to do this manually in a sprayer? Where you're sitting in the seat and you got your shutoffs over here and you're trying to turn them on and off? Nobody's tried that? Yeah, oh, okay. Somebody fast It's up. tough. Pardon me? It's tough no it, matter what you're doing. Where do you, where, I, I tried to do this back in the early 2000s before auto steer. So you're trying to steer straight and the farmer's trying to tell you, you know, say, there's spots in this field that don't need this, turn it on or off. You can't do it and stay straight. At least today we have auto steer. Today's technology that we have in sprayers, our rate controllers and our, con our monitors, we have the ability to shut off individual nozzles or sections. If we create a prescription, we can do that on the fly. So we're evaluating this um, if it works in Western Canada and so far in canola, the results are very promising and we're looking to, to um, bring this even further along in our pipeline and add things like that yellow flowering index, like some growth models to help us determine timing and the where to spray part of this. What we've done is in these, we put uh, uh, inverted check strips so um, to evaluate whether or not it's working. So in this section down here, we would have actually applied a fungicide and evaluated the yield and, uh, and gone in and done some scouting on disease progression and done the same thing we'd actually turn off the sprayer in this section to see what kind of results we get to make that determination. Christina. Awesome, so I'll just share my screen here. Who here likes to do trials on their farm? Quite a few of us. All right, so when you do these trials, you know, you're going through that harvest, you're looking at your yield monitor, seeing some differences, you're looking at the way wagon, you know, you figure out which one maybe yielded the most, but do you remember that in three years or do you remember that at the end of the day, right? How can you use that data going further down the road and how can you also pull out and tease out the differences in that data? So I'm going to pull up an example. This was a population trial in edible beans. So if we go to a population map, they did do a script on this field. So similar to what Marvin was showing. Um, they did four different populations in this field. Now, what they did is they took it one step further and in each of those zones, they did a higher population and a lower population to see if that actually paid off and if it was actually the right population for that zone. What we can do when we have technology like this and we have our data in here, we have both our planting and our population data, but we also have our yield data. So if we split screen, we can see the grower also has a yield map in here. And if you were to look at this, if you're more of a visual person, it's really hard to see the differences in that yield map, right? You can't really correlate those with the zones. Maybe if I zoom in where my crosshair is, you know, it goes over one of those check blocks and maybe I can see that there's something different there that I need to look into. What we can do is what we can do is draw a zone and create a region report. So I'm going to go back to this population map. I know I have yield data in here that was generated from the machine. So it came from the yield monitor. And I'm just going to simply draw a circle around one of these zones. So here it's going to give me my yield by population. So I get to see my yield for that population that was recommended to me, whether it was an agronomist or you decided that that was the right fit for it, and then that higher and lower. So here we can see the population they put on that zone. It was 79.3 kiloseeds per acre, and that yielded the highest out of the other two populations. So here, an easy way to circle that zone and see that it paid off and it yielded the highest. If I go to another zone, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but for example, if I circle a different one here, the yellow zone, again, that was our middle zone, and actually what we can see here, it yielded the lowest. So maybe that wasn't the right population recommendation for that area. So simply by drawing that circle, you know, you can start to tease out those differences. Again, there's lots of different environmental factors that could be going into this. So you can circle wherever you want. You can draw those regions and play different factors into it. But again, using those resources at your fingertips to be able to go back and look at your data and see where your yield advantages are. So Christina, I love the I love the technology, but man, that that example, what do you do with that? 
I, I, because the lower population yielded more, the higher population yielded more, the mid population yielded lower, and, and I say, yeah, throw that out, it means nothing. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. So if we put in a, a different map beside it, like maybe we looked at hybrids comparisons in this field, other differences in this field. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. If you go to that other middle zone too, same thing, you would see that one yielded higher than the other. But again, working with agronomists, agronomists working with those other factors. The data that we have available to us here doesn't take boots off the ground, right? So same thing as Marvin showed in his examples, as in mine, it doesn't take your knowledge, your eyes, and your team of experts boots off the ground to really analyze what's going on in that field, but it's giving you more efficiency. So better ways to target areas of that field and maybe see where you need to focus your scouting efforts to. <coughs> One last thing, and uh, we, we heard from uh, some of you that like to do trials. One of the things that uh, Bear Crop Science and our research and development, market development teams have started to do when they're positioning trials is using imagery, whether it's this scouting image, which is indexed off an NDVI image, or the actual NDVI image when they're positioning a trial and looking for potential differences in this field. So in this field, if I go to the indexed NDVI image, you know, we've got some kind of split, something happening kind of down the middle here in this particular year. This could be a hybrid difference. This could be a fungicide versus no fungicide. It could be something, but you have to start asking questions when you're positioning a trial. So if I'm gonna look at a trial next year, uh, maybe I am wanna do a hybrid trial, I'm not going to, maybe I'm not going to split that field because this is related to something in the soil or drainage or something. I might position my side by side over in this section because it looks more uniform. And instead of splitting it in two, maybe I'm going to do replicated strips to try to tease out and take away some of those environmental factors. I see, I'm not sure what kind of comment is going to come from Peter, but I know he's going to say something. No, I just look at that and, and it jumps out at me that that used to be four fields and and we've got old fence rows, right? Like one old fence row. Yeah. And like, the, 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 yeah. Yeah. And, and this goes back to Christina, your knowledge, your, your knowledge of these fields is going to help you. This isn't going to, this isn't going to replace everything that you've learned in your, whether it's 10 or 40 years of farming or the people that farm that land before you. It's not going to replace that, but it does add another layer of information that can help. You still have to ask those questions. Like, you're not going to use this only as that reason for <coughs> positioning a trial. I'm going to start looking back. Okay, what is planted? I don't have those layers, but is that a hybrid difference that's showing me? That? I saw that in, in the tar spot example. I don't know if I mentioned it. There are two hybrids in that field, and you can see that split in the field right to the line where those hybrids are on an NDVI image. Field view uh, subscription in, today is $149. Uh, if you are a Bayer Value customer, it's complimentary as part of uh, your Bayer Value. Um, and then there's other things. If you want to connect equipment, you need a field view drive, which is $329. 329 which connects to your equipment you need an ipad in your equipment to collect that data but talk to us talk to somebody at uh, bayer we have a number of field view dealers as well in uh, southwestern ontario that can really well. you all already have a top end ipad anyway rod so that that cost is zero <laughs> yeah apple kind of gets us there i must say <laughs> Your leader looks like he's trying to round you oh, out. Oh, I haven't heard a song right there. We don't have to be on very far to walk. Oh. If you guys have questions, so good for that. Any other questions? So, Marvin, uh, Christina, how far along are you with aggregate data? Because that's, I mean, the one trial is always very suspect, particularly with yield monitors, because yield monitors, uh, uh, we saw a Corteva, I mean, not Corteva people, but the Corteva document that said uh, based on their data one third of all trials from a yield monitor are wrong uh, like one third that that's a big number 
So aggregate data becomes much more critical in terms of trying to, to utilize this, yep. this information. How far along are you with that? So we have the ability to aggregate data. What we are, I would say that the internal struggle is privacy and our our field view users and customers comfortable with us sharing aggregated data. We we have the ability to do it today. Our privacy policy allows that. We just we're not sure I, I would say internally if we're ready to make that step. And then what what kind of aggregated data? I used an example earlier. Uh, John Deere this past spring put out aggregated data showing that uh, based on data generated in operation center captured over I believe it was five years showed that um, earlier planted soybeans out yield later planted soybeans mm. and it was thousands and thousands of sites uh, in the U.S. when it comes to our field view seed scripts which is our um, density recommendation by hybrid that we provide with field view that was uh, their results are based on aggregated data over I think 4 million acres in the U.S. over multiple years. So it is available. It's trying to determine what, what data do you want to see and can we generate it and provide it? So that's part of the issue as well. So what do you want to see, Peter? Oh, everything. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, but that's me. But, yeah, but no, <laughs> not everybody. But, so so that, that, that's the other thing is, is we have all this data. It's determining what data is the best data that makes sense to a farmer. So does, does Bear or DeKalb, uh, a part of Bear, utilize aggregated data when, when they're looking at, at things like uh, how many acres of seed to produce of 4909 versus uh, 5084 versus 5252? I would say not today, but it's being talked about. Because, and, and, yeah. and, and, and I mean, even your, your hybrid population data it's really good yeah but it's different if i'm farming in illinois on 11 feet of topsoil than as if i move to the sharp sands of norfolk county in ontario and, and so even that but anyway it's it's very no. cool stuff but it's very <coughs> it still has to be uh, adapted to the yeah. individual situation yeah. and i will say with that example peter data quality is huge so if you put 4909 with no space, that's different than when I put 4909 with a dash, right? So then it thinks those are two, <laughs> two different, different hybrids. hybrids. Yeah. yeah. Or, or if in your Quebec, you don't use a point, a desa, like a dot, you use the comma. Oh, yeah. Everything goes all to Hades. We've been there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So th that's the other thing. And, and the other thing with, you know, the comment you said about yield monitors, we do need a better to do a better job. And I'm not a farmer, but as producers at calibrating those combines more often than we do. And we also need to put pressure on Deer, Case, New Hall, and whoever to make improvements to yield monitors because they're really the same technology from day one to where we are today. One of the things we're looking at from a yield quality standpoint is actually more and more producers we're finding are putting scales on their grain, grain buggies and is there a way to bring that in as yield as opposed to the yield monitor or truing up that yield monitor based on that grain budget? So there's Mar a couple of projects marvin here. like i think i've asked before about like doing data by hybrid like post calibration because i yeah. post calibrate all my climate maps by my buggy scales yeah. so that i get accurate yeah. data but it comes back to like you can i can do my combine as much as i want but if i don't do it for every hybrid Oh, it's yeah. really not going to be yeah. that accurate yeah. and pioneers done that data set too and yeah. it's it's inverted sometimes yeah. yield monitor versus actual yield right yeah. so it's kind of a challenge like i love field view but again sometimes i'm like there's missing functionality yeah. that we need to actually analyze the yeah. data properly and henry not only not only by hybrid but even by moisture within like the hybrid right moisture. like if you start at 30% and then you end up at 22. Everyone's seen the yield monitor from day one to day three in the same field.